Hello there. Get ready to smile again with radio's home folks, Vic and Sade. Vic and Sade, written by Paul Reimer, is brought to you each weekday by the makers of the new Sure Mix Crisco. Do you have a son in the service who will spend the coming holiday season away from you in an army camp or aboard a Navy cruiser? Well, I'll bet he'll be pretty lonesome for some of his mom's swell cooking. And maybe you know some other boys in the service, too, who'd love to have their holidays brightened by a a big gift package of good things to eat. Believe me, you'll get three rising cheers if you'll send along a box full of crunchy, delicious homemade cookies. And listen, in order to help you make up a real surprise package, we're offering you a quick, easy new recipe for Crisco holiday cookies. And listen... In order to help you make up a real surprise package, we're offering you this quick, easy new recipe for these Crisco holiday cookies. All this amazing cookie recipe doesn't just tell you how to make one kind of cookies. Oh, no. It gives you directions for three delicious varieties, all from just one batter. You get about 50 cookies in three varieties from one magical batter. Why, there's rich chocolate fudge squares with pecans. Then there's coconut fruit macaroons loaded with candied fruits. But I'll bet the frosted mincemeat bars will be the favorites. And these Crisco cookies are so easy to make. You don't roll out your dough or chill it. Just spread it in a pan and bake. Then cut into squares, bars, or diamond shapes. Believe me, you'll want a couple of big batches of these cookies. One for your own cookie jar and the other for the boys in the service. So today, get a can of pure all-vegetable Crisco. And your free recipe for Crisco's holiday cookies. Just look for the Crisco display card at your store, then help yourself to the recipe attached. Oh, on that same recipe form, you'll find a couple of other tasty surprises, too. A recipe for spicy, rich mincemeat cupcakes. And one for delicious pumpkin pie with Crisco's sensational new pastry method for flaky tender pie crust. If your dealer hasn't received his supply of recipes yet, he will shortly. And remember, stock up with pure, all-vegetable Crisco. Well, sir, our scene doesn't open at the small house halfway up in the next block today. Instead, we take you to Mr. Victor Gook's modest office at the Consolidated Kitchenware Company, plant number 14. Vic appears to have a visitor, and the visitor is saying... Since this is business and strictly business, I thought I'd keep it on a business basis. Discuss it at my place of business, sir. Exactly. Well, fire away. I'm not interfering with your work. No, There's a lull in the day's occupation that is known as the children's hour. How do you mean? Nothing. Papa Wax is witty as all. Oh. Shoot. What's on your mind? Christmas present money. Uh Uh-huh. I had a foreboding just the other day I'd be approached on that matter shortly. Well, Christmas is getting close. No doubt about it. How much do you require? A thumping big sum. (laughs) $7,000? You consider me a comical fella, huh? Yeah. I am a gay dog. Very popular with my friends on account of the funny things I say. Uh huh. How much do you want to stick me for? Twenty five dollars. Hey, hey. I appreciate it's a huge amount. Took my breath away too when I arrived at that figure. But Gov, I've shaved it down as close as I could. See, the point is, I'm getting older every year. People expect regular Christmas presents as a fella gets older. I can't get by with giving little kid stuff anymore. Looks ridiculous from a fella fourteen years old. I came to your office this afternoon, Gov, to speak straight from the shoulder and ask your man... One moment, Margaret. My telephone. Go ahead. Yes? Mr. Hudson? Okay, Miss Hammersweet. Put him on. Don't let me interfere with any business you may be transacting, Gov. Quite all right. I won't stay but a few minutes. Stick around. Uh, Yes, Hudson? Which invoice are you referring to? Oh, no, I think I'd contact Plant 17 on that, Hudson. Fuss is the fellow to get in touch with. Gus Fuss. Don't you know him? Uh-huh. Well, he's a good scout. He'll give you all the dope you want on those invoices. Yeah. Okay, Hudson. Okay. You certainly do transact business, don't you? Mm, all the days work. i like to bring Bluetooth Johnson and some of the guys down here sometime and let them watch you transact business. You haven't seen anything. This afternoon's been very slow. There's days when that telephone rings and don't stop ringing. And this office is crowded with as many as five people all trying to talk to me at once. Is that a fact? Sure. Uh, What were you saying, Pete? I came to your office this afternoon, Gov, to speak straight from the shoulder and ask you man to man if you don't think a fellow my age ought to give his friends and relations regular gifts at Christmas time. (laughs) You spoke that piece for memory. Oh. Didn't you? 
Yeah. <laughs> speak it again. I came to your office this afternoon, Gov, to speak straight from the shoulder and ask you man to man if you don't think a fellow my age ought to give his friends and relations regular gifts at Christmas time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Uh, there's more. Oh? I have here in my pocket a document listing the names of those to whom I feel Christmas presents should be sent. With your permission, I propose to submit this document and request that you give it close examination. You write that out and memorize it? Yeah. Hmm? Not a bad speech. State your case in clear, concise, like... I beg your indulgence once again, Harry. Go ahead. Yes? Ms. Cook? All right, Miss Hammerstreet. Don't tell her I'm here. Beg pardon? Don't tell Mom I'm here. She don't like me hanging around your office. Okay. Figures I make a nuisance of myself, I guess. Uh-huh. Hello there, Dr. Sneech. Can you wait just a second? There's a pretty girl sitting on my knee, and I can't get the receiver up to my ear until... <laughs> How are you, kiddo? Uh-huh. Pray, what is your idea disturbing me at my office? When, this evening? Not that I know of. Suit you, suit me, Mr. Spooner. Okay, tell him to come on ahead. Sure. Sure. Is Rush home? Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, when he gets home, tell him I'm going to thrash him within an inch of his life. <laughs> because he's the wickedest, headstrong boy, that's why. <laughs> okay, Sadie. You bet. Oh, usual time. Okay, kiddo. So long. Mr. Miss Stembottom want to get an early start playing 500 this evening. Oh. Sadie's a good boy. <laughs> yeah. Where were we in our discussion here? I was going to show you this list of names. Uh-huh. See how long it is? Mm. It's longer every year. One of the penalties a fellow has to pay for growing old. Uh-huh. Alongside each name, I have an amount of money written down. That represents the sum I figure I ought to spend on that particular party. Mm -hmm. The list, you'll notice, starts off with mine. So it does. Eight dollars. A young fortune. Yes, it is, but doggone it, Gov. I don't see how I can get five for less. I think mom has got a decent Christmas present from me coming. Mm-hmm. I'd hate to spend one single penny less than eight bucks for anything I'd buy for Mom. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any more eight-dollar items? No. That's far and away the biggest single amount. There's a few two- and three-dollar items and one five-dollar item, but this eight-dollar item is in a class by itself. I see. Who rates the five-dollar Christmas present? Uh, you do. Well, may I expect... Uh, Uncle Walter, two-dollar present. Aunt Bess, two-dollar present. Uncle Fletcher, three-dollar present. Those are the big guns. Those three and you and mom kill $20 right there. Only leaves $5 for Cousin Yunsi and my Sunday school teacher and my many friends. No, God, I've shaved her down. I've shaved her down to rock bottom. I realize 25 bucks is a whopping big chunk of money. Chut, chut, Mr. Telephone. Go ahead. Yes? Mr. Willis? All right, put him on. Chicago. Oh, long distance? The company's own private wire. Yes, Willis? Oh, fine as silk, thanks. New? Uh-huh. Baby, get over that sick spell all right? Well, that's good. Which consignment? Well, didn't anybody from the shop here wise you up on that? Well, somebody should have. I believe that's in Ike Neesuffer's lap. Well, I'll check, Willis. Yeah. No, it's all right. Held up three days in Toledo, Ohio is all. Yeah, delivered this morning. Yeah, they shot us a wire. Yeah. Okay, Willis. Uh, going to be down this way soon, you think? Uh-huh. Well, don't take any wooden nickels. <laughs> okay, Willis. Come by. You sure do transact business. Oh, it's very slow today. I just like to bring Bluetooth Johnson down here sometime and let him watch you transact business. Oh, sure. <laughs> there she goes again, my George. Yeah. Yes? Who, Miss Hammersweet? Mr. Guppa. Oh, Mr. Gutstop. Sure, put him on. Hank. Uh -huh. <laughs> He's a corker, that guy. Had somebody else call my office. I can hear the billiard balls knock against each other down at the Lazy Hours pool parlor. You'd think Hank was some hotshot executive with a private secretary. The way. Uh, yes, Hank. Oh, can kick, I guess. Uh-huh. Uh huh? 
Temporarily cut short, huh? He hitting you for money, too? Yeah. Oh, I guess I can spare a couple of bucks, Hank. Yeah. All right. No, I'll be here the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> Send the special messenger, huh? Okay. Okay, Hank. Not at all. Bye. He's quite a sharp operator. Borrow two berries off a fella and sends a special messenger around to collect it. Huh. I expect he's involved in a critical game of bottle pool. Can't spare the time to come himself. Uh-huh. Uh, your mother doesn't approve of Hank, and I'd just assume she didn't know her letter. Oh, I wouldn't country. mention it around home. Might be just as well if you didn't. Oh, I wouldn't say anything. Where do we leave off in our interview? Oh, I was saying that my Christmas present for you and Mom and Uncle Walter and Aunt Bess and Uncle Fletcher eat up $20 alone. Only leaves five to be divided among this great big long list of friends. I figure I ought to buy Yuncy a dollar present, and I figure I ought to buy Miss Nago, my Sunday school teacher, a four-bit present. That only leaves three and a half for, um, Bluetooth Johnson, Smelly Clark, Leland Richards, Rooster Davis, Leroy Snow, Vernon Peggles, Willis Rohrbeck, Milton Welch, and Heine Call. Mm-hmm. See, Gus, even with $25 to start with, I only have three and a half left to buy presents for Bluetooth Johnson, Smelly Clark, Leland Richards, Rooster Davis, Leroy Snow, Vernon Peggles, Willis Rohrbeck. I believe I see eye to eye with you, Harry. What? I'm disposed to accept your bill of goods. You'll... Yep. The whole amount? Yep. Of course, you'll have to give me a day or two's grace to scare up the money. By George, Gus, I don't know how to... Telephone is rigged. Telephone is rigged. Yes? Mr. Burroughs, tell him to sit down. I'll be free in just a few minutes. Yeah. Uh, somebody waiting to see you? Yeah. Oh, I better go. No hurry. Oh, I might just as well go, I guess. Suit yourself. You, uh, didn't mind my buttonholing you here in your office? Not at all. It was business and strictly business, and I thought I'd keep it on a business basis. Surely. And, Gov, I can't begin to tell you how much forget I... Forget it, forget it. No, but... Doggone it, when I think what a high-class father... Telephone is ringing, telephone is ringing. Yes? Uh, not this afternoon, I'm afraid, Miss Hammersweet. No, from now on till five o'clock, I'll be completely tied up. Tell him I can see him tomorrow morning. Yes. All right. Golly, how you transact the business. <laughs> sure. No, but you do. Nothing in the world. Well, guess I'll be going. All right. It was a very pleasant interview. Shake hands? Sure. Come back again. I will. Goodbye. Goodbye, sir. Which concludes another brief interlude at that small house halfway up in the next block. But be sure to come along when we visit Vic and Say it the next time. This is Ed Hurley, he speaking. Do you want your stockings to wear and wear and wear? Well, I'll tell you what it takes. Avery Flakes, Avery Flakes, nightly care with Avery Flakes. Helps and runners. Why, you should just see the wonderful stocking wear women are getting with Avery Flakes care. 250, 295, even more than 330 hours of wear from a single pair. Now, long wear like that would interest you, I know. What was silk stockings getting scarcer? Yes, and here's how these women got such wonderful wear. They followed Ivory Flake's easy rules. Listen, do wash your stockings every night. Don't let them pile up. Do use lukewarm suds of pure Ivory Flakes. Don't use hot water or strong soaps. Do wash your stockings gently. Don't rub. We promise this easy care every night will help your stockings wear longer. You know, nine out of ten leading makers of America's most famous stockings advise nightly washing with new double-quick ivory flakes for both their silks and their nylons. So, help stop runs before they start. Now take heart, do your part. Ivory flakes each night are smart. Well, what I mean is, that way you'll help your stockings to wear and wear and wear. Hello there on Christmas Day. Get ready to smile again with radio's home folks, Vake and Fade. Vake and Fade, written by Paul Reimer, is brought to you each weekday by the makers of the new Sure Mix Crisco. A Merry Christmas to each and every one of you. Yes, all of us here on Vake and Fade hope you're enjoying this Christmas Day. We hope all your Christmas presents were just exactly what you wanted. 
And we hope you're having lots and lots of fun. So remember, when you're sitting around the Christmas tree today, that the makers of Crisco and we here on this program are wishing you a perfectly swell Christmas day. Well, sir, it's early evening as we enter the small house, halfway up in the next block now. And here in the living room, we find Mr. and Mrs. Victor Gook and their son, Mr. Rushko. The master of the menage is replacing the telephone receiver on its hook, having just this moment concluded a conversation with his friend, Y.I.I.Y. Skeeber. And Saint, who's been idly listening, inquires... What's a North Dakota River bottom revel? I gather it's a beloved old wintertime custom widely observed in this part of the country. I never heard of it, Carl. Neither did I. Of course, it's possible I might recognize it under some other name. It smacks somewhat of a chivalry, where there's a wedding, you know, and everybody comes and serenades the young couple and cigars are passed around and so forth. Well, do why I, I, why Skeever and them plan to pull that on us? Well, do you mind, kiddo? We're not planning on doing anything this evening, and they'll only here, be here about 20 minutes. We're likely less. How many of them? Eight. All fellas from the Bright Kentucky Hotel? Yeah. Skeever was so full of enthusiasm, I didn't see how I could very well discourage him. There's a North Dakota River bottom revel on foot, he says. Clear the track. Well, I had to tell him to come ahead. It's a gay, boyish, wintertime prank, don't you see? <laughs> don't let it disturb you, kiddo. I promise that they'll be here no more than 20 minutes. Will they want to come in the house? They'll dash in the house and then dash right out of the house. It's just a matter of, hello there, friends. By George, it's good to see you. Mrs. Cook, i never seen you look so charming. A little rush, too. Here, little rush, let me toss you into there. <laughs> Nobody better toss me into here. <laughs> you get the idea, don't you? Sounds like bobsled rides. Young people used to go on in Dixon, where you'd pull up at every farmhouse along the road and sing a song, and maybe they'd come out and give you a cider or hot coffee. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> North Dakota River Bottom Rebel. That sounds to me like kind of a peculiar name. So, why, Margaret? Because I don't think there's any river bottoms in North Dakota. There's probably river bottoms in North Dakota. No, don't worry about these guys swarming in on us, kiddo. It's just a matter of in again, out again, fin again. They'll stop by other places besides here, I expect. Oh, millions. That's the thing of it. They'll drop in on all of their friends. We hear a clamor out in front of the house. Eight fellas laughing and talking tumble out of their automobiles. The door bursts open and in swarms a crowd of merry pranksters amid a swirl of snow. It's the jolly, frosty wintertime, they holler. Hello, Miss. Hello, Sadie. Nobody in that bright Kentucky hotel outfit knows me well enough to call me Sadie. Well, Mrs. Cook, then. Hello, Mrs. Cook. You've got a bloom on your cheek like a 16-year-old. Here's little Rush, by George. Come here, little Rush. I'll toss you into there. <laughs> anyway, they can toss 116 pounds of solid flesh in the air. I'm beginning to catch the to spirit of the North Dakota River Bottom Revel Sadie. Yeah. <laughs> It's full of wholesome wintertime zest. Amid a swirl of snow, the rollicking fellas troop into the house. Hello, Vic. Hello, Stane. It's not, not snowing. snowing. What? It's not snowing. How can your eight North Dakota river bottom revelers troop in amid a swirl of snow when it's not snowing? Well, that's merely incidental. It'd be nice if it was snowing, though. <laughs> yeah. If it was snowing, your bright Kentucky hotel gang could troop in amid a swirl of snow. Yeah. And I'm glad to see you smiling, kiddo. <clears throat> when I give Y-I-I-Y Skeever the go-ahead on the phone just now, I was the least bit apt. Uh, maybe this is the season of the year when people aren't so apt to put up a holler. Yeah, sure. Well, after all, you might have kicked at the prospect of eight fellas busting in on you late at night. Late at night? Well, they'll be past somewhere between 11 and 12 o'clock. Oh, my. Well, we'll be up that late. Maybe we will. Sure. But... We'll be up that late. Mm. And they'll only stop in a quarter of an hour, don't forget. Mm. Yes, it's a beloved old wintertime tradition, especially popular in Ohio. Well, they call it an Ohio River Bottom Revel, then. Yeah. You're not acquainted with all these fellas that's coming, kiddo, but I bet you get a thrill just the same. No. They swoop in amid a swirl of snow. They throw it's off... It's not snowing. snowing. What? It's not snowing. Well, I appreciate it's not snowing. Then how can they swoop in amid a swirl of snow? You're being irritating on purpose, aren't you, Florida? No. They swoop in amid a swirl of snow. They throw off their hats and overcoats. Hello there, Vic. Hello there, Sadie. Who's this fine little man? It's young Rush. Come, little Rush. I'll push you into there. <laughs> like I'm going to be in the air for about half an hour. Oh, I, wonder... I haven't told you all that's in the Rollican crew. Uh-uh. Why, I, I, why, Skeever, of course. Yeah. 
Alf Musherton, Stacy Young. Uh -huh, I had an idea they'd be included. Glenn Webster, Raymond Beerman, and Cincinnati J. Kepp. Uh. Hugh H. Oatwalk. Uh. Oh, and that friend of Mr. Fuller's, Mr. Fisher. Michigan, Michigan? Yep. A Michigan, Michigan? Right. I can't get the guys up at school to believe that. Michigan, 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 I say. And all they do is sneer. It's a fact, I tell them. Here's a Mr. Michigan. First name is Michigan. He resides in Michigan. That's in Michigan. But everybody scoffs and yeah, talks. And... Most wondering. likely, good old never take any wooden nickels. What did I do with my other shoe reliable Bluetooth chances? Sit still, Howard. I'll get it. <laughs> Somebody calling up on the telephone amid a swirl of snow, eh, Mom? Yeah. <laughs> Hello? Oh, yes, why, I, I, why? North Dakota Mountain Peak Rump has called off a bit. Uh, oh, that a fact, why, I, I, why? Oh, it's too bad. Uh-huh. Oh, sure. Too bad. Well, the rest of you are coming along? Oh, sure. Oh? Oh? Well, uh... Well, that's okay. Sure. Fine, why, I, I, why? You bet, why, I, I, why? Be looking for you, why, I, I, why? Go by, why, I, I, why? If I said why, I, I, why that many times, my tongue would be twisted in between my teeth somewhere. Mine, too. Only five guys coming. Oh? Glenn Webster, Raymond Beerman, and Cincinnati J. Kep. Decided they'd better not stay up so late on account of having to transact important business first thing in the morning. They need their sleep. Uh. However, five's enough for happy wintertime mirth and gaiety. <laughs> sure. They'll swarm in amid a swirl of snow. Yeah, they'll swarm in amid a swirl of snow. Hello there, Rick. Hello there, Sadie. Hello oh, there, Rushy. Come here while I throw you up in the air. <laughs> Everybody's got the spirit of the North Dakota River bottom river. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the Dixon and Bob said parties that you described a while ago, kiddo. Just a crowd of happy-go-lucky gay blades celebrating the merry wintertime season and stopping by for a bright hello to their pals. Uh, oh, why did Y.I.Y. Skeeber telephone just now? To notify me the rollicking band of pranksters had been cut down from eight to five. Oh, but why did he bother? I mean, what difference does it make whether there's eight or seven or well, six? Well, I guess he had in mind the refreshments. Refreshments? Oh, solid peanuts is all. That's all you give a crowd of guys out on a North Dakota River bottom revel. Just salted peanuts. We got salted peanuts, haven't we? Yeah. That's all in the world that's necessary. Are you sure they won't expect coffee and sandwiches? Yep. Salted peanuts fill the bill. Mm -hmm. Five fellas swoop in amid a swirl of snow. Did you say, Rush? I just said uh, five fellas swoop in amid a swirl of snow. Yeah. Five fellas swoop in amid a swirl of snow. They throw off their hats and overcoats. Hello, Vic. Hello, Sadie. What's this? Salted peanuts? Let me at them. Seems like kind of skimpy refreshment. Not at all. If they stop by at a million different houses besides here, like you said, and everybody gives them solid peanuts, they'll be pretty darn full of solid peanuts after a while. Why, George, yeah. they'll be so full. Oh, and kiddo, another thing why I, I, why Skeever told me just now. He's afraid they won't arrive until after 12 o'clock. Hey, now. Well, it'll be just a moment or so past 12 o'clock. We'll be up that late. Well, think of the neighbors, though. They'll all be asleep. We want a bunch of men laughing and hollering out on the sidewalk at midnight when people... Stop on, Zan. Stop on, Zan. Well, get it, will you? I mean, it's just good old lost and found department. This is where we park company dependable Bluetooth Johnson. Midnight's pretty late for people to bust in. Well, they'll only stay a quarter of an hour. And remember, this is the gay season of the year. Hello? Yes? Yes, I believe he is. One second. Yeah. Like me, sir? Don't think so. Ain't good stuff. Uh-uh. Well, who? I don't know. One side. Huh? Yeah? Oh, yes. Why, I, I, why? Why don't they call him Kai-Yai or I spy oh. or something? person almost dislocates their jaw saying, uh. why, yai, yai, why? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's too bad, why, yai, yai, why? Yeah. Oh, well. Sure. What you lose in quantity, you can make up in quality. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you guys come right on ahead. A uh, big pardon? Oh. Well, uh, won't be any later than that, will it? Uh-huh. Oh, I see why, I, I, why. You bet why, I, I, why. Bye-bye, why, I, I, why. 
Somebody else won't be here to swarm in the mid us where there's no. Uh-uh. Alf Musherton and Q.H. Oatwalk have dropped out. Oh? Uh-huh. They don't feel like they better stay out that late either. How late? I heard you inquire. Oh, 12.30. Now, look, Becky. Well, we'd be up that late. First you said between 11 and 12. Then you said a split second past 12, and now you say 12.30. Oh, so, well. Uh... Who is five guys out of eight quitting the North Dakota River Bottom Revel, Gov? It don't leave many guys to come swarming in the house amid a swirl of snow. It leaves three. Three jolly good fellas is quite a lot of fellas when they're all as cheery and gay and hearty as these three are. Who are the three that's left? Why, I, I, why, Skeever, Stacy Yop, and Michigan Fishigan. Oh. You and Michigan Fishigan can laughingly talk over old times you enjoyed with your mutual friend, Mr. Buller. What old times did I ever enjoy with our mutual friend, Mr. Buller? Well, he's taking us out to meals at the Butler House Hotel on a good many occasions. Mm. Anyway, you and Michigan Fishkin got something in common to talk about. You both know, Mr. Buller. Huh. Is this Michigan Fishigan you're talking about, Gus? The same Michigan Fishigan that hails from Michigan, Michigan? You know it is. I just can't get my friends to believe that. I tell them Michigan Fishigan from Michigan, Michigan. And all they do is hoot and holler. He's a Mr. Fishigan, I say. He's a Mr. Fishigan, and his first name is Michigan. He lives in Michigan. That's a town in Michigan. But they won't believe it. Do you have sufficient solid peanuts, say? Oh, sure. With only three fellas coming, it won't require many. Golly, what if they do expect coffee and sandwiches? They won't. Uh. <laughs> I like good wholesome customers like this. Mm. We hear an auto horn out in front. Yes, at 12.30 at night. The laughter is heard. The door bursts open, and here are a crowd of merry vagabonds full of wintertime zest and friendship. Hello, Vic. Hello, Sadie. And who is this fine little man? I bet it's Rush. Come here, Rush, while I crush you into the air. <laughs> I'm going to be a wreck by the time I've been thrown over. Telephone, bring in. Telephone, bring in. I'll get it. Little old don't feed the animals. Is there a physician in the house? Trustworthy Bluetooth Johnson. Yeah? Oh, no. Really? What's the idea? Kind of a washout, huh? Oh, I see. Well, maybe you better tell him not to bother. No. Good time? Luck, why, I, I, why? Perhaps we better just forget all the... Pa- yes. Yes. Well, what does it mean? Okay, why, I, I, why? Okay, why, I, I, why? Now that's all why, I, I, why. You bet why, I, I, why. Oh, all those why, I, I, why's make me a little dizzy. Mm-hmm. Very well, why, I, I, why. Certainly, why, I, I, why. Bye-bye, why, I, I, why. What's the matter? That was why, I, I, why. We kind of halfway thought it was. He's dropped out of the North Dakota River, Bottom River, and so is Stacy Yacht. <laughs> Only do one guy. Michigan, Michigan, at Michigan, Michigan. Is he coming? Why, I, I, why, Skeever claims he is. Coming all by himself? I guess so. At what time? One o'clock. One o'clock in the morning? Yeah. Will he swarm in amid a swirl of snow, Gus? What? Michigan, Michigan, at Michigan, Michigan, I'll swarm in the house amid a swirl of snow. He'll throw off his coat and hat. Hello, Vic. Hello, Sadie. Who is this fine little man? I bet it's Rushy. Come here, Rushy, while I toss you in the air. Well, neighbors, so ends today's visit at this small house halfway up in the next block. But seems like something's always going on at the residence of Mr. and Mrs. Victor Good. And I'll be waiting there to open the door for you when you drop in on Bacon Say the next time. This is Ed Hurley, he's speaking. Well, sir, it's early evening as we enter the small house halfway up in the next block now. And here in the living room, we find Mr. and Mrs. Victor Gook. Vic has apparently said something to upset his wife because she's regarding him wrathfully. Listen, noose. It's a lot more than just a nuisance. It's a big, mean job of work. Well, I didn't know, kiddo. No, you never know. That's the man of it. Trivial thing in the world. He handed me a wad of bills and says, Gook, here's $20. Next time the missus goes shopping, ask her to pick me up a few Christmas presents and mail them. Huh? Well, that's not, not much of a chore, is it? I have to pick out a bunch of presents, wrap them, address them, and mail them, huh? Oh, I never thought anything about it, Sage. 
I imagine it was something you could maybe do in five minutes. Yeah, that's the man of it. I bet if somebody give you a bucket of paint and a brush and said, next time the missus is down on Center Street, ask her to put a couple of coats of green paint on the people's bank building, you'd take it. Oh, hey, a ray of sunshine. Bully wants you to buy yourself a Christmas present. I'll pay you for your trouble. What kind of a Christmas present? Any kind you want, I guess. Take it out of the $20. Oh, thanks. Okay. I'm a fat kid. How many Christmas presents am I supposed to pick out? I got a list here in my pocket. Let's see it. Well, it says, uh, I'm a bachelor, Gook. I don't know what to buy for people. Think your missus would help me out? Is that the list? Yeah. Uh, Mr. and Ms. R.K. Leeferts, 1109 West Kilgore Avenue, Pittsburgh, Ohio. Well, who are Mr. and Mrs. R.K. Leeferts, 1109 West Kilgore Avenue, Pittsburgh, Ohio? I don't know. Are they Mr. Bullard's cousins or uncles or in-laws or something? I don't know. What shall I buy for them? Okay. How much shall I spend on them? Well, have a hard kid, though. Read the next name. If I'm to be tortured and made miserable over this, I'm almost tempted to undertake the job myself. You go right ahead. Don't strike me as such a task, walking in a department store and picking up a few odds and ends. Don't it? No. Read the next name on the list. Uh, Cyril, May, Eugene, Agnes, Henry, and Edna Gooding. Rural Route 8, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Is that all one family? I suppose. All got the same last name, Gooding. Are they children? I don't know. Does Mr. Buller want them each to have a separate present, or does he want just a single present for the whole outfit? Well, I expect you can use your own judgment on that. Because he said, tell the missus she's a free agent, Gook. Won't make the slightest difference to me what she picks out. Read off them names again. Uh, Cyril, May, Eugene, Agnes, Harry, and Edna Gooding. Six. Cigars, or shall I buy baby rattles? Well, I imagine they're children. Do you? What makes you imagine that? They sound like children. Sound like... Oh, seven, maybe? Mm. Brothers and sisters, you suppose? Yeah. Six brothers and sisters, all age seven. Boy, there's an outfit that's got that Canadian family with their quintuplets backed off the map. Well, send them handkerchiefs. You can't go wrong on handkerchiefs no matter what their age is. Any others on your list? Oh, quite a few more. Mm. Mr. and Ms. Margaret Gack, 218 South Union Boulevard, Humphreyside, Michigan. Mr. and Mrs. Margaret Gack. That's what Buller's got jotted down here. Is the man's name Margaret? Well, I presume. What kind of a Christmas present would you pick out for a Mr. Margaret Gack? Handkerchief. Handkerchief for Mrs. Margaret Gack, too? Well, sure. Oh. Miss Olive Soppers, 213,529 North Oak Street, Seattle, Iowa. That can't be right. Miss Olive Sopper says it's 213,529 North Oak Street. That can't be right. Her home must be right near the edge of town. Buller must have made a mistake. When are you going to see Buller again? Sometime in January. Mm. Cora, Mildred, Arnold, Allen, and Bertie Feach, Anderson, Wyoming. Brothers and sisters? I imagine. What age do they sound like? Oh, heck, you know. 22? My handkerchief idea is a solution to this whole business. Everybody uses handkerchiefs. Read me some more nice names. Uh, Reverend Griswold J. Fix. Fix. Holy smoke. What's the matter? This name, I can't pronounce it. F-I-X-O-L-M-H-T-H-R-Y. Fix home three, I guess. Reverend Orswell J. Fix home three. Where does he live? 19,608,402 West Grove Street. There's at 716 Creeper Boulevard, Yatchman, Texas. Suppose he'd like a nice handkerchief? Probably be charmed with a nice handkerchief. Is that all the people? No, uh, Emmett Chindler Jr. and Moses. Moses? Yes. Yeah. Who's Moses? Maybe his little boy. Or his horse, or his dog, or his butler, or his uncle. Well, it was awful sloppy the way he jotted down these names. Uh, Emma Chindle Jr. and Moses, room 619, Indianapolis, Wisconsin. Room 619, Indianapolis, Wisconsin. Yeah. That's some dandy address. 
Emma Tyndall Jr. and Moses probably live in some hotel, and Buller carelessly forgot to put it down. Uh, Cyril, May, Eugene, Agnes, Harry, and Edna Jackson. Rural Route 10, Funnel Orchard, Montana. That's the same outfit you read before. Uh-uh. Well, sure it is. Look up at the top of your list there. Oh. Oh, I remember that. Oh, those. no, by George. Sure, Cyril, May, Eugene, Agnes, Harry. Oh, wait a minute. The people up at the top of the list are named Goody, and they live in Minnesota. This other gag's name is Jackson, and they live in Montana. Both outfits got the same bunch of first names? Yeah. Cyril, May, Eugene, Agnes, Harry, and Edna Goody. Rural Route 8, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And down here, Cyril, May, Eugene, Agnes, Harry, and Edna Jackson. Rural Route 10, Funnel Orchard, Montana. Quite a coincidence. Yeah. Any more nice people? Uh, Culvert C. Culvert. Culvert Culvert Company, Culvert Building, 2126 Culvert Street, Culvert, Kentucky. Oh, calm now. No, that's down here. Let's see one. Hmm? Culvert C. Culvert. Culvert Culvert Company, Culvert Building, 2126 Culvert Street, Culvert, Kentucky. Hey, look at all those names. There's quite a few. How much money did Mr. Buller give you? Twenty dollars. And out of that twenty dollars will have to come postage and everything. Well, twenty dollars ought to stretch out okay if you buy handkerchiefs. I should think twenty dollars is less. Telephone ring, telephone ring. I'll get it. Fred and Ruthie. Wouldn't be surprised. Feel like five hundred? Sure. Mr. and Mrs. Joel Eggwalk, Wilkers, South Dakota. Oh, well, those people are all Mr. Boy's relations. I imagine a good many are. Yes. Oh yes, Fred. Just had an idea it was you. No, not a thing in the world. Why, I bet we jump at the chance. Sure. All right, Fred, we'll be looking for you. You bet, Fred. You bet. Goodbye, Fred. Let's pump up a tire. They'll be here in half an hour or so. Uh -huh. Here's some relations. Huh? Glenn Stover, Helen Willis, and Farstall Buller, 560 West Wilp Street, Mexico City, Connecticut. Hmm. Here's the last name on the list. Michigan, 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 Michigan. What? <laughs> <laughs> that his name is Michigan. First name is Michigan. Lives in a town called Michigan. In Michigan. Oh, no. Yeah. Michigan, <laughs> Michigan, Michigan, Michigan. Oh, my stars. Yeah, I'm glad to see your good humor is restored, Stacey. Uh, how many names on that list? Uh, 34. <laughs> Can you get 34 hang good handkerchiefs for 20 bucks? Oh, sure. How much do you have to make the postage? Oh, oh, say five dollars. At least fifteen dollars for handkerchief. Uh, well, that's in the neighborhood of uh, forty-five cents per handkerchief. Can you get a pretty good grade handkerchief for forty-five cents? Oh, get wonderful handkerchiefs for forty-five cents. I'll handle the mail and the stuff. All right. I'll help you wrap the packages too. Give you a hand with the address. <laughs> All right. I like to do favors for Buller because, after all, he's a big shot in the company. Help on Drian, help on Drian. Uh, good old kind to keep off the grass, never look a gift horse in the mouth, trustworthy Bluetooth Jensen. Bluetooth is with Rush down at the YMCA. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, yes, Fred. Oh, now, hey. No, but you're always treating. Well, all right. <laughs> you want to throw your lovely spandulics to the four winds. All right. What flavor ice cream you want? Maple. Now, why do you constantly say maple? You appreciate Fred despises maple. Tootie fruity. He despises tootie fruity also. What don't he despise? Chocolate. Okay, chocolate. Fred! Vic is shouting and screaming his head off, clamoring for chocolate flavor. Yes. Yes. Fine. All righty, Fred. Goodbye. Maple. Well, heck. What's that young lady's address on Mr. Buller's list there, the list of far off? Uh, Miss Olive Sappers, 213,529 North Oak Street, Seattle, Iowa. <laughs> and who are the people that live in the room? Emmett Chindle Jr. and Moses, room 619, Indianapolis, Wisconsin. And the Calvert fella? Culvert C. Culvert. Culvert Culvert Company. Culvert Building. 2126 Culvert Street. Culvert, uh, Kentucky. And the man that's name and address and everything all right. Mr. Michigan, Michigan of Michigan, Michigan. 
Which concludes another brief interlude of that small house halfway up in the next block. But be sure to come along when we visit Vic and Say the next time. This is Ed Hurley, he's speaking. Well, sir, our scene doesn't open at the small house halfway up in the next block today. Instead, we take you to Mr. Victor Gook's modest office at the Consolidated Kitchenware Company, plant number 14. Vic appears to have a visitor. And the visitor is saying... Since this is business and strictly business, I thought I'd keep it on a business basis. Discuss it at my place of business, sir. Exactly. Well, fire away. I'm not interfering with your work. No. There's a lull in the day's occupation that is known as the children's hour. How do you mean? Nothing. Papa Wax is witty as all. Oh. Shoot. What's on your mind? Christmas present money. Uh-huh. I had a foreboding just the other day I'd be approached on that matter shortly. Well, Christmas is getting close. No doubt about it. How much do you require? A thumping big sum. Seven thousand dollars? <laughs> You consider me a comical fella, huh? Yeah. I am a gay dog. Very popular with my friends on account of the funny things I say. Uh Uh-huh. How much do you want to stick me for? Twenty-five dollars. Hey, hey. I appreciate it's a huge amount. Took my breath away, too, when I arrived at that figure. But, Gov, I've shaved it down as close as I could. See, the point is, I'm getting older every year. People expect regular Christmas presents as a fella gets older. I can't get by with giving little kid stuff anymore. Looks ridiculous from a fellow 14 years old. I came to your office this afternoon, Gov, to speak straight from the shoulder and ask your man... One moment, Margaret. My telephone. Go ahead. Yes? Mr. Hudson? Okay, Miss Hammersweet. Put him on. Don't let me interfere with any business you may be transacting, Gov. Quite all right. I won't stay but a few minutes. Stick around. Uh, Yes, Hudson? Which invoice are you referring to? Oh... No, I think I'd contact Plant 17 on that, Hudson. Fuss is the fellow to get in touch with. Gus Fuss. Don't you know him? Uh Uh-huh. Well, he's a good scout. He'll give you all the dope you want on those invoices. Yeah. Okay, Hudson. Okay. You certainly do transact business, don't you? Mm, All the days work. I'd like to bring Bluetooth Johnson and some of the guys down here sometime and let them watch you transact business. You haven't seen anything. This afternoon's been very slow. There's days when that telephone rings and don't stop ringing. And this office is crowded with as many as five people all trying to talk to me at once. Is that a fact? Oh, sure. Uh, what were you saying, Pete? I came to your office this afternoon, Gov, to speak straight from the shoulder and ask you man to man if you don't think a fellow my age ought to give his friends and relations regular gifts at Christmas time. <laughs> you spoke that piece for memory. Oh. Uh. Didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> speak it again. I came to your office this afternoon, Gov, to speak straight from the shoulder and ask you man to man if you don't think a fellow my age ought to give his friends and relations regular gifts at Christmas time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very good. Uh, there's more. Oh? I have here in my pocket a document listing the names of those to whom I feel Christmas presents should be sent. With your permission, I propose to submit this document and request that you give it close examination. You write that out and memorize it? Yeah. Not a bad speech. State your case in clear, concise, like... I beg your indulgence once again, Harry. Go ahead. Yes? Mrs. Cook? All right, Miss Hammerstreet. Don't tell her I'm here. Beg pardon? Don't tell Mom I'm here. She don't like me hanging around your office. Okay. Figures I make a nuisance of myself, I guess. Uh Uh-huh. Hello there, Dr. Sleech. Can you wait just a second? There's a pretty girl sitting on my knee, and I can't get the receiver up to my ear, and she... (laughs) How are you, kiddo? Uh Uh-huh. Pray, what is your idea disturbing me at my office? When, this evening? Not that I know of. Suit you, suit me, Mr. Spooner. Okay, tell him to come on ahead. Sure. Sure. Is Rush home? Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, when he gets home, tell him I'm going to thrash him within an inch of his life. <laughs> because he's the wickedest, headstrong boy, that's why. <laughs> okay, Sadie. You bet. Oh, usual time. Okay, kid Joe. So long. Mr. Miss Stembottom want to get an early start playing 500 this evening. Oh. Sadie's a good boy. <laughs> yeah. 
Where were we in our discussion here? I was going to show you this list of names. Uh-huh. See how long it is? Yeah. It's longer every year. One of the penalties a fellow has to pay for growing old. Uh-huh. Alongside each name, I have an amount of money written down. That represents the sum I figure I ought to spend on that particular party. Mm-hmm. The list, you'll notice, starts off with mom. So it does. Eight dollars. A young fortune. Yes, it is, but doggone it, Gov. I don't see how I can get by for less. I think Mom's got a decent Christmas present from me coming. Mm-hmm. I'd hate to spend one single penny less than eight bucks for anything I'd buy for Mom. Mm-hmm. Uh, are there any more eight-dollar items? No, that's far and away the biggest single amount. There's a few two- and three-dollar items and one five-dollar item, but this eight-dollar item is in a class by itself. I see. Who rates the five-dollar Christmas present? Uh, you do. Well, may I expect... Uh, Uncle my... Walter, two-dollar present. Aunt Bess... Two dollar present. Uncle Fletcher, three dollar present. Those are the big guns. Those three and you and Mom kill twenty dollars right there. Only leaves five dollars for Cousin Yuncy and my Sunday school teacher and my many friends. No, God, I've shaved her down. I've shaved her down to rock bottom. I realize twenty five bucks is a whopping big chunk of money. Chut, chut, Mr. Telephone. Go ahead. Yes? Mr. Willis? All right, put him on. Chicago. Oh, long distance? The company's own private wire. Yes, Willis. Oh, finest silk, thanks. New? Uh-huh. Baby, get over that sick spell all right? Well, that's good. Which consignment? Well, didn't anybody from the shop here wise you up on that? Well, somebody should have. I believe that's in Ike Niesuffer's lap. Well, I'll check, Willis. Yeah. No, it's all right. Held up three days in Toledo, Ohio is all. Yeah, delivered this morning. Yeah, they shot us a wire. Yeah. Okay, Willis. Uh, Going to be down this way soon, you think? Uh-huh. Well, don't take any wooden nickels. <laughs> okay, Willis. Come by. You sure do transact business. Oh, it's very slow today. I just like to bring Bluetooth Johnson down here sometime and let him watch you transact business. Oh, sure. <laughs> there she goes again, my George. Yes. yes. Who, Miss Hammersweet? Mr. Guppa. Oh, Mr. Gutstop. Sure, put him on. Hank. Oh. Uh, he's a corker, that guy. Had somebody else call my office. I can hear the billiard balls knock against each other down at the Lazy Hours pool parlor. You'd think Hank was some hotshot executive with a private secretary. The way, uh, yes, Hank. Oh, can't kick, I guess. Uh huh. Uh huh. Temporarily cut short, huh? He hitting you for money too? Yeah. Oh, I guess I can spare a couple of bucks, Hank. Yeah. All right. No, I'll be here the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> Send a special messenger, huh? Okay. Okay, Hank. Not at all. Bye. He's quite a sharp operator. Borrowed two berries off a fella and sends a special messenger around to collect it. Huh. I expect he's involved in a critical game of bottle pool. Can't spare the time to come himself. Uh-huh. Uh, your mother doesn't improve a Hank, and I just assumed she didn't know I left. Oh, I wouldn't me. mention it around home. Might be just as well if you didn't. Oh, I wouldn't say anything. Where do we leave off in our interview? Oh, I was saying that my Christmas present for you and Mom and Uncle Walter and Aunt Bess and Uncle Fletcher eat up $20 alone. Only leaves five to be divided among this great big long list of friends. I figure I ought to buy Yuncy a dollar present, and I figure I ought to buy Miss Nagel, my Sunday school teacher, a four-bit present. That only leaves three and a half for, um, Bluetooth Johnson, Smelly Clark, Leland Richards, Rooster Davis, Leroy Snow... Vernon Peggles, Willis Rohrbeck, Milton Welch, and Heine Call. Mm-hmm. See, Gus, even with $25 to start with, I'll only have three and a half left to buy presents for Bluetooth Johnson, Smelly Clark, Leland Richards, Rooster Davis, Leroy Snow, Vernon Peggles, Willis Rohrbeck. I believe I see eye to eye with you, Harry. What? I'm disposed to accept your bill of goods. You'll... Yep. The whole amount? Yep. Of course, you'll have to give me a day or two's grace to scare up the money. By George Gov, I don't know how to... Telephone is rigged. Telephone is rigged. Yes? Mr. Burroughs, tell him to sit down. I'll be free in just a few minutes. Yeah.
Uh, somebody waiting to see you? Yeah. Oh, I better go. No hurry. Oh, I might just as well go, I guess. Suit yourself. You, uh, didn't mind my buttonholing you here in your office. Not at all. It was business and strictly business, and I thought I'd keep it on a business basis. Surely. And, Gov, I can't begin to tell you how much forget I... Forget it, forget it. No, but doggone it when I think what a high-class father... Telephone is ringing, telephone is ringing. Yes? Uh, not this afternoon, I'm afraid, Miss Hammersweet. No, from now on till five o'clock, I'll be completely tied up. Tell him I can see him tomorrow morning. Yes. All right. Golly, how you transact the business. <laughs> sure. No, but you do. Nothing in the world. Well, guess I'll be going. All right. It was a very pleasant interview. Shake hands? Sure. Come back again. I will. Goodbye. Goodbye, sir. Which concludes another brief interlude at that small house halfway up in the next block. But be sure to come along when we visit Vic and Say it the next time. This is Ed Hurley, he speaking. Hello there. Get ready to smile again with Radio's home folks, Vic and Say. Vic and Say, written by Paul Reimer. Brought to you each weekday by the makers of the new Sure Mix Crisco. You know, I think if you ask any man what he likes best for dessert, his answer would be pie. It doesn't make much difference what kind of pie it is, just so long as the pie crust is so flaky and tender, it breaks at the touch of a fork. And that's the kind of pie pure all vegetable Crisco is famous for the country over. Yes, for years, good cooks have turned to Crisco for the answer to flaky, tender pie. But now the Crisco people have made it possible for everybody to turn out pies like this. They've developed a sensational new pastry method for their shortening that's so sure fire, even beginners can turn out flaky, tender pies. And friends, you can get this new sure fire pastry method in your December copy of the Good Housekeeping magazine. Just look for the Crisco ad. And when you do, notice it tells you to be sure and use only Crisco with this sure fire pastry method. You see, Crisco and Crisco Sure Fire Method do away with the two chief causes for pie failure. Too much water and too much handling of your pie dough. Most cookbooks haven't told you the exact amount of water to use, but Crisco's new pastry method does. That's right, there's no guesswork anymore. Because this new Sure Fire Method tells you the exact amount of water to use. Why, you get a pie dough that rolls out like a charm, and boy, what wonderful pie crust. So why not be sure your pie crust turn out flaky and tender. Ask for pure all-vegetable Crisco at your store today. Then follow Crisco's new Sure Fire Pastry Method. Remember to get this new Sure Fire Pastry Method. You don't have to buy anything. You don't have to go anywhere. All you have to do is look in your December issue of the McCall's Magazine, Ladies' Home Journal, Woman's Home Companion, or Good Housekeeping. You will find complete directions for Crisco's new Sure Fire Pastry Method in the Crisco ad. Well, sir, the evening meal has been over only a little while as our scene opens now. Here in the, the living room of the small house, halfway up in the next block, we find all our friends assembled. Mr. and Mrs. Victor Cook are seated side by side on the Davenport with sections of the newspaper, but they aren't reading at the moment, being requested by their small son to listen to us filling the passage from our third lieutenant to the Stanley story. The handsome young officer regarded the band of counterfeiting coffee ground fortune tellers with the utmost contempt. You are nothing but a band of counterfeiting coffee ground fortune tellers, he taunted, and he threw a protecting arm around Lady Margaret. The beautiful woman coquettishly extricated herself from his affectionate grasp and trotted off a few pages. I love you, sang out Sir Lieutenant Stanley. I love you too, Carol, his sweetheart, and even the heart of the scoundrelly band of counterfeiting coffee ground fortune tellers. Me neither. Okay. So is Lady Margaret. Okay. Uh, we got anything on the docket particularly tomorrow evening? Tomorrow evening? Not that I know of. Why? Why? Huh? What's this now? This is a very even question. Somebody's coming here? Well, maybe if it's okay with you. Who's coming? Perhaps somebody likes. Perhaps someone you like. Uh huh. I can tell by the way you're acting, someone I like. Oh, what's the discussion, people? Mom, is my book. 
Oh, sir, Lieutenant put the kibosh on the counter. He did. He seen to it that every last one of them got their just desserts. I see you take that one. <laughs> Beg pardon? You said the counterfeiters got their just desserts. I hope the desserts were ice cream cake. <laughs> oh, I know it's not what you were doing. What's the discussion? Yes, what is it? Who's fishing us tomorrow night? Robert and Robert Haynes from Hoopston, Illinois? Nope. Why, why, Flirt from Nebraska? Nope. Well, who? It's somebody like that. Here's the guess. Alf Mushroom? You get more. You get more. Why, I, I, why, Steven? Who's the third in remaining barber at the Butter House Hotel Barbershop? Stacy Alf, huh? He's coming. Well, we got nobody else coming, have we? We got no plans for tomorrow night. What's Stacy Alf coming for? Dave, do you remember last week Stacy all of a sudden turning from right-handed to left-handed? No. Sure you do. It was the afternoon we were going to clean the attic, and I was writing a special magazine article. All but... right, I remember. What about it? Dave, during the time that has elapsed, since Stacy Yop suddenly turned from right-handed to left-handed, the phenomenon has repeated itself no less than 60 or 70 times. He went back to right-handed again? He went back to right-handed and then back to left-handed. And then back to right-handed and back to left-handed. And so on and so forth and so on and so forth until it's enough to make a person head Can he change himself into a right-handed fellow or a left-handed fellow whenever he feels like changing? No, he can't. The switch from right-handed to left-handed is sudden, involuntary, and unexpected. He may be right-handed fellow at breakfast and then turn into a left-handed fellow long about noon. That's it. Science tells us, kiddo, that people are right-handed or left-handed depending on the whereabouts in their skull of their medulla and their oblongata are located. Now, you explained that the other day. Oh, did yeah. yeah. Did you understand it? Sure. If your medulla is on the right side of your skull and your oblongata on the left side of your skull, you'll be right-handed. The medulla and oblongata, of course, are the parts of you. Whee! Three parts? Nothing. What's the out coming here for? I'm getting around to that. Good. The converse of what I've just described naturally is true. If a person's medulla is situated on the left side of their skull and their oblongata on the right side... I know all about that. Are you sure? What's the op coming here for? Well, I'll tell you. Dr. Fowler B. Stockard, a distinguished Montana physician, surgeon, lecturer, and brain specialist, arrives in the city tomorrow. That's so? Dr. Stockard is to deliver a talk at the Butler House Hotel addressing the members of the Better Business Men. Yeah, I read about that in the paper. Sure. These days, fresh bread about it in the paper. Congratulations, Congrats. Oh, I read stuff in the paper. This particular item... I'm I still see. curious about that old right-handed Stacy and why he's this enough tomorrow night. You can't put two and two together? No. Stacy wishes to consult with Dr. Stockers. Oh. In all probability, Dr. Stockers will have sound theories about Stacy's astounded condition. He may be able to put his finger on the reason for Stacy's being right-handed one minute and left-handed the next. Then Dr. Sockers is coming too, then? Yes, we may well be proud to admit him to our home. He's a famous Montana physician, lecturer, surgeon, teacher, brain specialist, and polo player. The four of us can get up a game of polo. <laughs> Five of us. I'll be on deck. You are witty, right? <laughs> Not me. Mom's the witty one. If Stacy out feels like he ought to see a doctor, why don't he go see a doctor? Why did he drag the doctor here? Stacy Yopstade is a candidate for membership in the lodge, and I may add a very good friend. That's all fine and wonderful. But I still want to ask my question. Why did he drag the doctor here? If I felt like I ought to consult the doctor, I'd go consult the doctor. I wouldn't tell the doctor to meet me at Ruthie Stembottom's house or someplace. You don't catch on why I've invited Stacy to bring Dr. Sockers here? Uh-uh. You might if you thought of Uh-uh. I got a halfway idea, Gus. A humorous way, no doubt. No, on the level. What is your halfway idea? Well, this Dr. Doctor is traveling around the country and naturally has no office in town. Can't go consult a doctor in his office if he's got no office. Good, good, good. That's an unwritten law. Right, clear thing. Oh, that's wonderful. Do you see anything? Not particularly. I can see why Stacy don't visit the doctor at his office. The doctor have a no office. But why don't the doctor visit Stacy? You can puzzle out the answer to that question. I don't believe I'll bother. Stacy resides in the Bright Kentucky Hotel. Well. Don't you grasp the point? Uh-oh. I bet you do, don't you? No, I don't. Not this trip. The Bright Kentucky Hotel is no place to consult a doctor. Why, Why not? not? The noise. The freight trains, passenger trains, work trains, switch engines roar past there every minute of the day and night. The furniture rattles. 
The air is full of smoke. That cinder is constantly pounding against the window pane and everything else. Dr. Sucker wouldn't be able to hear himself think. Oh, the Bright Kentucky Hotel is no place to consult a physician. Why, if Dr. Sockers attempted to take Stacy's temperature, the, the thermometer would shoot right out of his mouth from the vibration. Huh. Isn't that true, Harry? <laughs> yeah, I guess it is at that. And Stacy's room is on the railroad track side of the building to boot, isn't it? Yes. It's impossible to carry on a conversation in a room that's on the railroad track side of the Bright Kentucky Hotel. Everybody has to yell their head off, and then you can't understand each other. It would be beneath the dignity of a distinguished man like Dr. Fowler V. Stockers to yell his head off. Yeah, I guess so. So now you have the picture in clear perspective, Stacy. In order for Stacy Yop to consult with this famous physician, a meeting place must be provided. As Stacy Yop's good friend and well-wisher, I have offered my home as the meeting place. I am sure you can have no real objection. <laughs> Besides doing Stacy a good turn, I also have a scientific interest in the matter. His predicament is baffling and bewildering. I'm anxious to hear Dr. Sucker's diagnosis. What is it exactly the Salem Stacy? One minute he's right handed, the next minute he's left handed. Precisely. Well, that don't sound so terrible serious to me. I bet you'd find it upset. Not if I felt all right other ways. The thing of it is, Dave, if your medulla is located on the right side of your skull and your oblongata is located on the left side of your skull, we may safely assume that you are... Left-handed. Right-handed. All right, right-handed. Don't go into that oblongata track anymore. What is there in particular about this business The father Stacy? Well, take the date. Yeah. Normally right-handed. Stacy found himself at the breakfast table this morning holding his spoon in his left hand. Did that scare him? It didn't exactly scare him but it made him wonder if his medulla had switched places with his oblongata during the night to where his medulla had somehow worked its way over to the left oh, side. All right, of him. go on with your story. As I say, he found himself holding his spoon in his left hand. <laughs> Two hours later, while at work in the Butler House Hotel barber shop, he was shaving a client and was astounded and agitated to notice that he was holding the razor in his right hand. Oh. He'd gone back to right-handed in the short space of two hours. Oh, hey, Gov, I bet he's just like Vernon Pagel. It must be. In baseball, Vernon bats either left-handed or right-handed, just as he decides. Also, he can throw right-handed or left-handed. Scientific term for that, Rush, is ambidextrous. Your chum, Vernon Pagel, is ambidextrous. Your chum, Stacy Yop, is ambidextrous. Not at all. No? Not at all. Shall I tell you why? Okay. During moments when Stacy Yop is right-handed, his spoon or his fork or his razor or whatever he's holding feels awkward and unwieldy in his left hand. During moments when he's left-handed, articles in his right hand feel awkward and unwieldy. Uh-huh. You see? Uh-huh. And here is the clinch. Mm-hmm. This morning, at breakfast, Stacy found himself holding his spoon in his left hand. At dinner this noon, he found himself holding his spoon in his right hand. And at supper, tonight. Yes. He found himself holding his spoon. Yes, in either hand. He had two spoons? He had two spoons. He was eating with both hands? He was eating with both hands. My goodness. Stacy Yop was left-handed and right-handed all at the same time. She will. Yes, she will. Do you wonder if he wishes to consult Dr. Fowler D. Oh, goodness sakes. What is it, Huh? Nothing. Well, neighbors, so ends today's visit at this small house halfway up the next block. But it seems like something's always going on at the residence of Mr. and Mrs. Victor Cook. I'll be waiting there to open the door for you when you drop in on Vacant Stay the next time. This is Ed Hurley. Nine out of ten, nine out of ten, leading stocking makers pay. Use Ivory Lake, you Ivory Lake, you'll help stockings wear that way. Yes, nightly average lake care does help stockings wear longer. And that's an important thing to remember these days, because silk stockings may soon be practically impossible to get. Why, just listen to the marvelous records of wear that were rolled up when we tested many leading brands of silk stockings with ivory plates. Why, during a test with some lovely Kaiser stockings, we saw records like this. 281 hours of wear. 288. Even as much as 344 hours of wear from a single pair of sheer silk stockings. So don't use warm soap. Use new ivory plates for your stockings every night, too. Just see if you don't get longer wear. Remember, nine out of ten leading makers of famous stockings advise new double-quick ivory plates for both their silk and their nylon. And uh, nine out of ten can't be wrong. Oh, nine out of ten, nine out of ten leading.
Magic stocking makers pay. You have it late, you have it late. You'll help stockings wear that way. Every night, you have it late, and your stockings really wear. Mr. Pete, and it's off again by George. Because you and I are sitting out here in the swing, huh? Got to in talking on the telephone? Yes, and also because Mr. Chin Bunny and Peter are over on Carl's porch eating ice cream. Well, you take history, it'll repeat itself. <laughs> That's right, Uncle Fletcher. You know, I think Mr. Chin Bunny eats his ice cream in that big, elaborate, ostentatious way just for show. He loves ice cream. Watch how he slides the spoon in and out of his mouth with his head way back and his eyes rolling around. He almost shudders with delight he loves ice cream so much. That's what I mean. Nobody's that crazy about ice cream. I think he goes through that performance for show to indicate to his hostess he's enjoying himself. Well, maybe. There used to be a lady come visit us once in a while in Dixon when Bessie and I were small. She used to go through a lot of foul to row to demonstrate she liked what my mother served for dinner. Oh, oh Mrs. Rush, I never tasted this mealy potatoes. Oh, what biscuits. Oh, Mrs. Rush has never got to give me the receipt for this pie. Oh, dear, Miss McCauley, her name was. Uh, we stopped talking to so long on the phone. Michigan, Michigan, from Michigan, Michigan. Oh. When I went to the kitchen to get a drink, I heard him saying, That's right, fish. Fish. Fish is short for fish again. <laughs> fish, fish from fish, fish. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mr. Chin Bunny's going to eat his cake now. Yeah, got his ice cream all cleaned up. I bet 45 cents he eats that way for sure. People don't love ice cream so much they fool and pant and get dizzy. He probably thinks. By golly, you clear aren't the two people I like best in all the world. Be warm in that living room, I bet. Yeah, but I'm about smitted. You've been in here for must have been half an hour. Uh-huh. Well, I guess I'd better see if I can hoist these poor old bones up on the railing. Okay. Take pardon? I'll give you my seat. Not at all, not at all. I'm glad to sit on the railing. There's my seat. Well, thank you. We go through the same ceremony every night. If I didn't offer to get up and let you sit in the swing, you'd yank me out of it by my ear. Yes, that's right. I would. Uh -huh. Mr. Chin Bunny over on Carl's porch eating cake. Mm -hmm. He looks like he was a cat and somebody was scratching his back. Yes, he does. <laughs> oh, heck, Chin Bunny, quit smirking and shivering. No cake is that good. Uh, I bet he don't carry on like that at the breakfast table morning. I bet he don't eat it. Well, now it's Michigan, Michigan from Michigan, Michigan. Fine. Well, you know it was him I was talking to. I went in to get a drink a while ago and heard you talking to fish. Mm -hmm. I saw Mr. Crider from Toledo, Ohio this afternoon. Also Mrs. Jackson from Terre Haute, Indiana. And I had a chat over the telephone with Ms. Montgomery from St. Paul, Minnesota. Sarcasm, huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, but every time you mention that man's name, you tack on where he comes from. Michigan, Michigan from Michigan, Michigan. Michigan, Michigan from Michigan, Michigan rolls off the tongue in a sleek, oily fashion. It has a pleasant flavor as it creeps over the vocal cords. Michigan, Michigan from Michigan, Michigan. It's a lot like one, two button your shoe. Yeah. 
Three, four, shut the door. Uh-huh. Five, six, pick up six. Mm-hmm. Seven, eight, shut the gate. Mm-hmm. Nine, ten, pick I that. think you've successfully gotten your point across, Margie. Yeah. I had a very interesting chat with the Michigan, Michigan, from Michigan, Michigan, Kido. Mm, must have. Talked a whole half hour. He put me privilege to something profoundly fascinating. Oh. Profoundly fascinating to me, at least. Well. You're aware of how absorbed I am in trades and trade procedures? Yes. Michigan, Michigan, from Michigan, Michigan. Oh, why well, don't you fun. just say Rish Fish from Sish Mish? Huh? Instead of Michigan, Michigan, from Michigan, Michigan, say Rish Fish from Sish Mish and save yourself breath. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mine's cracked several pretty fair jokes this evening. See the short, far belly laugh comedian, that girl. <laughs> <laughs> Rish Fish from... Sishmish getting up a parade, is he? Rich Fish from Sishmish told me about an outfit in Independence, Missouri called the Parade Information Bureau. You send this organization $10 a year and they'll mail you a weekly bulletin given the date and locality of every parade scheduled in the United States. I'm going to send my ten bob dollars first thing in the morning. I don't quite get the idea, Doc. Well, it's not a very difficult idea to get. Parade Information Bureau. That ought to explain it. Well, I expect it. Well, look, let's say the school children of Lincoln, Nebraska, plan on having a parade a week from Tuesday. Okay. Let us also say that the American Legion fellows in Seattle, Washington, plan on having a parade the 16th of September. Uh huh. Let us go a step farther and say that the city employees of Bangor, Maine, plan on having a parade the 12th of August. Uh huh. All right. In the weekly bulletin, as issued by the Trade Information Bureau, all these phrases will be listed. Oh. Well, so which? Who cares? Who cares? Who cares except the school children of Lincoln, Nebraska, the American Legion fellows of Seattle, Washington, and the city employees of Bangor, Maine? I don't care. I do. Why not? Yeah. If I know when and where parades are scheduled to take place, I might be able to make plans to attend some of them. You, you make mean plans to mark the school children of Lincoln and the Rally to do one at a time? Well, naturally, I wouldn't travel clear to Lincoln, Nebraska, or Seattle, Washington to march in a parade, unless, of course, it was some extra special occasion. But suppose there was a parade scheduled in Peoria or Springfield or Rockford or LaSalle. If I knew about such parades in advance, I could make arrangements to be on hand for it. But why? I like parades. If you heard the school children of Peoria were going to have a parade, you'd buy a ticket to Peoria and walk down the street with them? Possibly. I don't know. Michigan, Michigan, or Michigan, Michigan was telling me just now that there are fellows who do nothing else but the marching parade. Pickpocket? How is that, Trish? Pickpocket they say follow parade. You're a witty man, old fella. No, but they... There's a cucumber on your chin. Wipe it off. I haven't had any cucumbers in a week. Michigan, Michigan, from from Michigan, Michigan, Michigan. says that they're afraid enthusiasts like myself who spend their entire time marching in parades. He was telling me about one guy that marched in five parades in five cities within a space of 96 hours. Marching along in this fifth parade, he fell exhausted to the pavement and died shortly thereafter. The National Association of Parade Lovers intend to erect a statue to him as soon as they get $10,000 in their treasury. How much they got now? Well, unfortunately, only 85 cents. But the organization is new, and it takes well, time to build it. Mr. Bunny's going to have another helping of ice cream. <laughs> He's the original ice cream kid. And uh, I watch him slide his spoon in and out of his mouth, scraping off layers of ice cream and shuddering and grinning and rolling his eyes around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, yes, Mr. Chin Bunny. You just can't taste that delicious. Yes, sir. First thing in the morning, I'm going to send my ten bucks to the Parade Information Bureau at Independence, Missouri. I'll find out what's going on. Well, I may be able to locate a few parades in cities I visit on my inspection tour next month. I just can't understand the thrill you get out of walking down the street. <laughs> The phrase, walking down the street stage, hardly fits the noble institution we know as the parade. People walking down the street is what a parade amounts to. 
There are some who think of a red, red rose as a weed. Leroy Snow gets mad when people refer to his violin as a switch box. Exactly. Oh, now, Mr. Chin Bunny, hey. What's he doing? Huh? Leaning way back in his chair with his eyes closed and his feet stretched out like he's just fainting with delight. His ice cream is driving him crazy. It's so delicious. Yeah. <laughs> Walking down the street. Does this outfit in Missouri have any peachy parades coming up? Do you plan on marching in? No, Michigan, Michigan, from, from Michigan, Michigan, Michigan. Read me off the weekly bulletin he received this morning. City's listed are too remote for me to attend. What are some of them now? Well, the Junior Girl Scouts are having a parade that's coming Friday in Little Rock, Arkansas. An organization known as the Old Pioneers, over 85 years of age, having a parade early next month in Slopman, Utah. T.W. Smith, president of the Anti-Horse Thief League, is conducting a parade in Emporia, Kansas. Those are just a few. It'd be nice if you went to Arkansas and marched with the Junior Girl Scouts, wouldn't it? It would. I would march with the Junior Girl Scouts in the capacity of Deputy Marshal. Where is your husband, Miss Go? Oh, he bought a ticket for Little Rock, Arkansas. Seems he's interested in walking down the street with the Junior Girl Scouts. You may laugh and scream and howl with glee. Parades are my hobby. I'm not ashamed of that hobby. I like parades. Mm-hmm. I like parades. All right. Gee, you was Mr. Chin Bunny. Your ice cream just can't taste that delicious. What's he doing? Sliding off in his chair. Mm-hmm.